He said, you know, what are the big trends going on around the world, both in the developed countries and the developing countries? And we saw four, health and wellness, which for us was around disinfecting and helping stop the spread of illness. The second was sustainability. The third, affordability, and the last one was diversity, or the changing demographics. And we sat back and asked the question, is our lineup of brands and the way we approach business really relevant against those trends? And those of you who are insatiably curious may be wondering why the chairman of the Sierra Club is introducing the CEO of Clorox. <laughs> the simple answer would be that we have a partnership with Clorox. They approached us several years ago and they told us that they wanted sustainability to be one of the drivers of their future. And they offered us a line of household cleaning products, Greenworks, that we were proud to be associated with. <coughs> but the deeper answer is there's something in the DNA of Clorox. And there's something in the DNA of its leadership that makes it a surprisingly good fit with the Sierra Club. Now, you may think I'm being a Bay Area chauvinist since I live in San Francisco and Clorox is headquartered in Oakland. And perhaps that's true. So please, Big Apple, forgive us. But on the other hand, I want to point out that when I first came to work for the Sierra Club in the mid-1970s, we had on the bottom of our letterhead a quote from our founder, John Muir, which said, when you try to pull one thing in the universe, you find that it is hitched to everything else. And when I first met our first honoree tonight, the CEO of Clorox, and I sat down and began, began to talk to him, his company makes a water filter. Oh, Brita. It's a good water filter. Some of you may have used it. He immediately, from the fact that he made this water filter, began to have a conversation with me about the sustainability of the way we deal with water. And I was impressed. It was a really good first act on. And then as I kept talking with him, he kept pushing me and pushing me and pushing me. So finally tonight, I asked him, okay, what's really important about the DNA of your company? What is your company encoded to do? And he gave me one excellent but somewhat conventional answer innovation. Any successful company in the 21st century will tell you that it's DNA codes for innovation. I have yet to meet a CEO who tells me, uh, we don't innovate, that's, that's our thing is we don't innovate. <laughs> and then he said insight. And he, had, he stopped me. And I had to ask him, okay, I know how you encode for innovation. I know the rules. How do you encode for insight? And he said, well, we bring people together who are asking the same kind of question in different places and we make them work together. He said, we had people who were listening to customers. We had people who were listening to end users. We had people who were listening to the people who made products. And they weren't talking to each other and we brought them together. And when he said that to me, I said, aha, this is about bringing people together. This is what John Muir, our founder, said about ecological thinking. So I'm proud tonight to introduce Doc Naus, the CEO of the Clorox Corporation, the man who I think of all of the business leaders in America that I know does the best job of acting on ecological thinking. Don, will you come up? Thank you, Carl, and um, uh, thanks very much for the kind words. It's very uh, important for us to have Carl here. 
And obviously, thank you to the Foreign Policy Association. When I was thinking about my remarks tonight, I was reminded of a Big Apple story, actually. And that was of Mario Cuomo, when Mario Cuomo was governor of New York. And he was speaking at a, an event much like this and didn't know what to say. So he went back to St. John's University to see his mentor, Father Flynn, and he said, Father, what do you think they want to hear? He said, well, Mario, what I would do if I were you is I would think of yourself as the body at an old-fashioned Irish wake. They, they need you to have the event, but they don't expect you to say much. <laughs> so I'll try and keep it brief. But this, this award is very important for us because social responsibility is at the core of our values at Clorox. And we have a number of values, but the foundational value is do the right thing. And that's what engages our thousands of people around the globe that they believe we are doing the right thing. And about three years ago, when I started having these conversations with Carl, we stepped back and we said, you know, what are the big trends going on around the world, both in the developed countries and the developing countries? And we saw four, health and wellness, which for us was around disinfecting and helping stop the spread of illness. The second was sustainability. The third, affordability, and the last one was diversity, or the changing demographics. And we sat back and asked the question, is our lineup of brands and the way we approach business really relevant against those trends? And that question and that focus led us to forming relationships with organizations we had never talked to, like the Sierra Club, like Greenpeace. And that, that focus and those relationships led to, for example, the creation of Greenworks, that line of natural cleaners that Carl talked about that both he and I believe can mainstream natural cleaning by making it more affordable and more available for people. It led to the acquisition of Burt's Bees, a line of natural personal care products that use renewable resources. It led to a refocus on Brita to help not only give consumers a more affordable option to bottle water, but hopefully eliminate some of the 38 billion of those bottles that are landing up in landfills in this country alone. And it led to a totally different manufacturing process for bleach, where we're in the process right now of eliminating the shipment of chlorine across this country and changing it out to water-based bleach coming into our plants, which eliminates a big security risk for a lot of the cities and towns we deal with. So this focus, these new relationships, these differing viewpoints, I think that's at the core of what the Foreign Policy Association is all about, this fundamental belief that bringing together a collection of world leaders with diverse viewpoints can lead to a better result. And we've seen that in action at Clorox. And I think we've achieved that by simply listening and listening to those different viewpoints. And it's when you assume that everyone deserves a seat at the table, I think it, it's amazing how much more fun and productive the dinner can be. So we thank you for this award. Certainly very meaningful to us, and thank you, Carl, for being here. It's uh, my pleasure tonight to introduce uh, Frederick Smith, the founder and chairman of one of this country's iconic business enterprises, Federal Express. Fred founded the company some 40 years ago and has become ubiquitous delivering 8 million shipments daily by 280,000 employees using 80,000 vehicles and 660 airplanes, which incidentally is, I think, about uh, double the size of the United Airlines fleet. And all of these go to some 220 countries and territories around the world. I dare say there is probably no one in this room who has not received a package or a letter or sent one that hasn't used Amer Federal Express's services. And what a technological marvel it is. A couple of weeks ago, my wife gave me an iPad for my birthday. As I anxiously awaited the arrival 
of its delivery, I would steal down to our den, go on the computer, and track its progress. <laughs> From, you know, the pickup in uh, Shenzhen to uh, Hong Kong, then to Anchorage, Alaska, then to Memphis, where I was a little afraid because of the flooding and so on, it was going to get stuck. <laughs> but then to our house at the appointed hour. And I thought that was some mean feat. And I applaud you for it. In addition to uh, Fred's substantial business achievements, he's not neglected his civic responsibilities. He sits on numerous philanthropic and business boards and boards of business and trade associations. And it's a great pleasure on behalf of the Foreign Policy Association to award to Frederick Smith and to Federal Express the Foreign Policy Association Corporate Responsibility Service Award and uh, Fred, I would ask you to come up now to receive the award. Congratulations. Thank you very much. The citation reads, FedEx demonstrates daily that we live in a world defined by the bonds that connect us and not by the borders that divide us. Mr. Frederick W. Smith, as the leader of FedEx Corp, has demonstrated his commitment to good corporate governance and good corporate citizenship in the communities around the world that FedEx serves. We congratulate you. Thank you very Thank much. Well, I appreciate that very kind uh, introduction, uh, and I accept this award uh, with great humility and appreciation, uh, not on my behalf, but on behalf of those almost 300,000 men and women that make up the FedEx teams around the world. Uh, I can assure you that we have a very unique vantage point on many of the issues that uh, this venerable organization deals with on a routine basis. And <clears throat> it's of great interest to me at the present time how the pessimism has uh, overtaken most of the industrialized world, and probably for very good reason. And terms of the financial management at the governmental level and uh, perhaps a couple of years ago spectacularly at the enterprise level at least in the financial sector. But when you have the window on the world that we do at FedEx every day carrying these <clears throat> incredible advances in human technology and innovation around the globe, you can't help but have a bit more optimism than you see in the in the daily press. Uh, what's happened, as best I can tell, over the last 20 years is for the first time in human history, you have deployed a low-cost, standardized, visual, translative means of exchange in the form of the internet that connects any human being that has uh, an iPad or an iPhone or a Blackberry to any other human being in the world so equipped. And with that device or the bigger brother or sister in the form of a PC or a laptop, you can avail yourself of every type of good and service produced in the world. And the reality of, of the world today because of, I think, uh, America's leadership and willingness to open up its markets after World War II, first to rebuild Europe, uh, devastated by the war, 
rebuilt in part with the Marshall Plan funds that our taxpayers provided, and then the rebuilding of Japan, and more recently the unprecedented miracle of taking over half a billion Chinese citizens out of the most abject poverty and giving them a reasonable lifestyle and, and opportunities that would have been inconceivable in that country just a few years before we started operating there 25 years ago. And as technology marches on and we continue to, to have the innovation and, and developments that we see on a daily basis, including today, if you saw on the news the first time a, a cell has actually been produced uh, in the laboratory, life produced synthetically, the potential for further improvement in the human condition is far greater, in my opinion, than the difficult problems which we face, uh, like the question of Korea and, and Iran and, and terrorism, which, while great, pale in comparison to the problems that were faced by the members of the Foreign Policy Association that were put up on the screen just a few moments ago during the big challenges of the Cold War, the Korean War, Vietnam, and, and World War II. So we very much uh, enjoy being a facilitator of that improvement in the, in the human condition. Uh, we try to make appropriate contributions in terms of sustainability. We pioneered uh, new vehicle uh, technologies, including the first all-electric vehicles used in uh, commercial service in the United States. We just introduced a couple of months ago at the station not more than three uh, miles from here. Our FedEx Express operation is completely equipped with uh, hybrid pickup and delivery vehicles, which we developed with the Eaton Corporation and the Environmental Defense Fund. Our new 777 airplanes, which uh, ply the skies of the world, are significantly quieter, more fuel efficient than uh, the airplanes that, that they're replacing. Uh, numerous solar installations throughout the, uh, the FedEx network now. And many, many examples of FedEx team members lending a hand to people who have had uh, a difficult time of it. Uh, like the great tragedy in Haiti, the horrible earthquake in Chengdu in China last year, uh, tsunami relief, uh, on and on down the line. We have the capability and the resources to do that when called upon, and uh, it's, it's one of the things that we are most proud of in our organization as well. So I hope that gave you a little window on the activities of those 300,000 folks out there working every day to, to deliver these items for you. And as I said at the onset, we're deeply appreciative of this honor, and it's in their name that I accept it. Thank you. So, uh, I thought I'd read from a New Yorker story from, a, from uh, 2005, which talked about her arrival at Brown University. Now, Brown, as most of you know, is the heart of Providence. It is, I, I arguably, the most beautiful university in the world, magnificent buildings of many centuries. I'm not a brown person. Um, uh, but, it, but, it, but it was, you know, I, I think many people arrive there and go, this is perfect. Ruth did not think it was perfect, however. So three months after she'd arrived at a director, at a trustees meeting, uh, she went to the board of trustees, this is the New Yorker talking, with elements of a comprehensive renewal program. The plan eventually included the adoption of need-blind admissions, which I think many of us feel strongly about. The establishment also of 100 new faculty positions, an increase in faculty salaries, constructions of a major new research facility, a new biological sciences building, a new building for the medical school, creation of a series of multidisciplinary centers, renovation of undergraduate living quarters, major investment in the library, major investment in computer facilities. To fund this program would cost $1.3 billion, equal to Brown's entire endowment. After that, she warned the university would have to be in permanent fundraising mode. 
I, I'm sure that the trustees fell out of their seats when they, when they heard this, but this is a very determined uh, person and all has been achieved. So with that, I'll read now uh, from a series that, that <laughs> briefly that, that Newsweek did on, on the great leaders in America today. And this is just a short quote about that period. When I first got to Brown, I came up with a package of ideas centered around my plan for academic enrichment. It appears to some people to be overreaching, too grand grandiose, impractical, but it took marshalling of lots of groups to accomplishment, accomplish it, and accomplishment she did. So with that, Professor and President Ruth Simmons. I feel obligated to say that Stanford is also a very beautiful campus. <laughs> John. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Room. Uh, Mr. Latif, members of the board of the Foreign Policy Association, distinguished guests, good evening. I want to extend to all of you the warmest greetings from the Brown University faculty, staff, students, and trustees. It's a special privilege for us to be here to thank you for the work that you inspire and to acknowledge the importance of continuing to support important principles of global understanding. Now, it's very important that I say that with me tonight are friends and trustees of Brown who every day make a difference in this regard. I begin with a note of thanks to Bill Rhodes, a Brown alumnus and past trustee emeritus, past senior vice chairman of Citigroup and a member of the Foreign Policy Association board, who has been a steadfast advisor and leader in Brown's international efforts. Chancellor Tom Tisch, who is here um, before me, uh, also a Brown alumnus and our uh, chairman of the board. Uh, I'm sure he is known to you no doubt for his consistent efforts to advance the cause of understanding at home and abroad. In addition, um, I want to at least acknowledge the presence of a number of people who are of immense help to me in guiding our international efforts and just generally supporting this wonderful enterprise of education. Trustee and alumnus, um, Trustee Marty uh, Granoff, a retired chairman of Valdor, whose compassion and generosity of spirit transcends borders. Trustee Emeritus James Harmon, president and chairman of the export, former chairman of the Export-Import Bank of the United States. Jim, where are you? Jim, thank you so much. Um, he is our leading supporter of African studies at Brown. Trustee Emeritus and alumnus Ben Lambert, chairman of East Still Secured and the brilliant leader of our strategic growth initiative. Trustee Emerita Robin Neustein, Senior Director of Goldman Sachs, who has been a leader in the role of the arts in international understanding. Trustee and alumnus Ralph Rosenberg, who has been extraordinary, extraordinary in helping us raise funds to uh, do everything that you've heard about. Friend and Brown parent Paul Freeberg, Chairman and CEO of Continental Grain Company and founding member of Brown's China Advisory Council. Friend and Brown parent Parag Saxena, a founding member of Brown's India Advisory Council. I just want to say how grateful I am to all of them for their contributions to making Brown more international. Now, let me say that since I was a young girl, I, I've been entranced with how individuals of goodwill influence the way that others across the world see their countries. Growing up in the South in the 1950s under a public policy, at odds with what I knew to be fair and just, I marveled at the fact that from outside our country, there were voices of comfort and reason questioning our nation's social policies. It was the actions of such people at home and abroad that encouraged me to imagine a time when our nation's domestic practices would change. So rather than accept limitations on where my abilities could take me, I work to improve my mind and to learn about the mysterious world outside of my segregated neighborhood. 
And I also began to believe that the world would be considerably improved if concern for others was broader than our immediate neighborhood. So at the age of 17, I set off to Mexico to learn Spanish and live with a Mexican family. That was a difficult but stimulating experience, and it instilled in me a lifelong interest in continuing this wonderful journey around the world to deepen my understanding of how to affect positive human relations. I subsequently added French to my course of study and traveled to France the following year with the experiment in international living. So all these organizations that make it possible, think of that. Here's a kid from the inner city of Houston who, with no resources whatsoever, stumbles upon all of these organizations like the experiment and somehow magically is transformed outside of this environment. So I decided there could be nothing better than this, and so I decided to let major in languages. And my decision to focus on languages made a good deal of intellectual sense to me, but at the same time, choosing language study was an act of defiance and a fitting response to the narrowness and insularity that segregation bred. To choose international study was to break the color line, to overturn career restrictions, and to learn without the weight of cultural stigma. Now, because of that choice, it has been my great fortune to have a career in which at every turn, involvement in world cultures and affairs has been not only possible, but central to my daily work. Universities have gone a long way in improving on their approach to internationalization, and I'm delighted I was telling somebody at the table that when I first started my career, all of those, all of us internationalists were sort of shoved off to the side. Today, internationalization occupies the center in our universities, and I think that's a very good thing. Um, we have very ambitious goals today in international affairs, but even with our increasingly ambitious international goals, there's still an enormous amount that we must all do to ensure that our interest in and commitment to world affairs results in the kind of global equilibrium that increases the potential for stability, peace, and prosperity. In university life, I'm proud to say, where the sharing of knowledge across borders is widely acknowledged and accepted, and where modern tools greatly facilitate shared learning, scholarship, and research, there is great hope and growing evidence that we can make a major contribution to that equilibrium through access to learning. Mindful of the time, I'm going to skip to the end of my comments. Um, there's so much I could tell you about Brown. It really is such a wonderful place. Um, I hope you'll allow me to say that. Um, it is a wonderful place um, because our students are so involved in international life and because they believe passionately that it is their duty to be involved and to be knowledgeable about world affairs, and I'm very proud of that. I think universities will continue their important work in crossing borders, but I hope that we can also increasingly extend this work to inner cities and remote areas, to minorities and working class men and women, because after all, they too will help to elect and form leaders. They too will prepare their children to embrace or forsake global understanding they too hold the key to advancing the cause of international understanding. The participation of all citizens in world affairs could not be more urgent than in these troubled and volatile times. So I'm especially pleased to stand with you in this endeavor, and I thank you most sincerely for the honor that you bestow on me tonight. Thank you. With this, we present the Foreign Policy Medal uh, to President and Dr. Ruth Simmons. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you it's very, you very nice jewelry. Um. <laughs> Would you like to wear it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit, a bit, bit heavy. Security Good evening. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. John Hennessy. 
Since joining Stanford's faculty in 1977, John has brought a groundbreaking and pioneering approach to science and the education and training of global leaders for the 21st century. John has implemented his vision to grow Stanford and keep it at the cutting edge of solving the world's problems. John has served as Stanford's provost, dean of the School of Engineering, and chairman of the Computer Science Department. But it is in the position as Stanford's 10th president that John has expanded Stanford to make it the global institution that is revered and admired the world over. Of the many innovative pro programs that John has initiated at Stanford, he was instrumental in founding the Stanford China program in 2007 and ushered in a new era for international studies at Stanford with the creation of the Freeman Spogli Institute in 2005. Stanford, under John's leadership, has brought a true interdisciplinary approach to the study of pressing international issues. That approach has focused on transcending academic boundaries to deal with real world issues. And all of this has further enhanced Stanford's reputation as a preeminent global institution and helped to foster the formation of a cooperative global economy. More recent, John has forged partnerships with Saudi Arabia in the areas of energy um, and computer science, em emphasizing the conceptualization of a post-oil world, something the global community must acknowledge and formulate. In short, John has shaped a new kind of university, one that actively participates in the pressing issues of today across a wide range of disciplines and in a wide variety of ways. A couple of weeks ago, Forbes named John second on its list of America's best bosses, and gentleman that he is, John did not ask for a recount. In addition to his work at Stanford, John is one of the foremost authorities on computer architecture. He developed a high-performance reduced instruction set computer, RISC. I honestly have no idea what a com that computer does, but whenever I hear the word RISC in particular after a day like today in the market, I get a bit worried. Um, that work led to John co-founding MIPS Technologies in 1984. He is a member of both the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. John also serves on the board of directors of two fairly obscure technology companies, Google and Cisco. And he is, by any definition, the ultimate rocket scientist and someone truly deserving of this award. So please join me in welcoming and congratulating John Hennessy. Well, thank you, Ruth. I can't help mentioning on this beautiful day as I took a walk through Central Park and down through the Ramble that New York City and Stanford share one thing in particular. Uh, Central Park and the Stanford campus were designed by the same architect, Frederick Law Olmsted, who gave us both wonderful places. We are privileged in this country to have something that the rest of the world would like to have, the best higher education system in the world, the best universities and the best colleges. Indeed, if you ever want to feel like a rock star, become a university president and then go to China or India or South America or Eastern Europe and you will realize what a remarkable asset we have in our higher education system. Now, when you come back home, you have to remember you're no longer abroad. And I, <laughs> I like to remind people of this with a little analogy. You see, a university president is like a caretaker at a cemetery. There are lots of people under him, but nobody's listening. It reminds us all that the great work in universities is done by the faculty and the students. And increasingly, whether that work is in research or teaching, it is implicitly and very much international in its perspective. It happens in our research, whether it's the work that Secretary Perry and Secretary Schultz are doing on trying to make nuclear weapons a thought which we no longer have to worry about that obviously has an international dimension. It happens in the work that my colleagues are doing in the Center for Democracy and Development to try to figure out how we move from an authoritarian style of government to a democracy, 
certainly a problem that we've learned is much harder than we anticipated in Iraq and Afghanistan. But it happens in our education as well. When we bring a young person from around the world to get their education at Stanford, the very first student who graduated about eight years ago from Mongolia, a young woman who appeared on our campus, I thought she was 22, it turned out she was 30, and her 15-year-old son was with her. 15-year-old son at the age of 30. She completed an interna a degree in international policy studies, her master's, and is now back leading the democracy movement in Mongolia. Or the students we send abroad to try to help them understand what it means to be a global citizen. And we send them around the world. We send them to Asia and Africa and South America and Europe. But I'll close with what I think is the most interesting encounter that I've ever had with a student. On the day of my inauguration, we were having a reception in the main quadrangle after the inauguration. And up, up walked a young man dressed in a Maasai warrior outfit and handed me a leadership staff. The leadership staff had been made by the elder of his village, and he was now giving it to me, as he said, because you are now the elder of my new village. <laughs> well, this young man continued his work at Stanford. That was in 2000. The next fall, in 2001, he was headed back to Kenya for a short visit home before the school year began, and decided to stop in New York City to visit another Kenyan student who he happened to know. He was here on 9-11. Obviously, his trip was interrupted. But after about two weeks, he managed to make the trip home. He went back to his villagers and told them of the great tragedy that had happened in New York City. The villagers took up a collection of the most valuable asset that the Maasai have, their cows, <laughs> and donated them to the city of New York. You may have remembered that headline in the New York Times, 14 cows for the city of New York. They took a simple view. This country was giving their young man a great education, and they had to give back in this moment of tragedy. The story reached its final conclusion recently when he graduated, and we brought the elder from his village over. And the elder sat down with me, and with the help of Kameli, our student, he translated. And he said to me, well, I want you to know that those cows are still there, <laughs> and they're all American cows. And so are all the babies. <laughs> it is a reminder that in this century, no country can be an island. And the more we interact and mix with people around the world, the better we will make the world. I've had the tremendous privilege as president of the university of, uh, to travel around the world and represent Stanford and represent higher education. And I have loved doing that. I've also had the great privilege of having a wonderful person supporting me there and helping me as co-ambassador and my wife, Andrea, for more than 35 years. And it has truly been a joy to represent that. Thank you for this wonderful award and thank you to the association. Thank you. Can you give the award and a picture? Okay. Thank you. It is my pleasure this evening to uh, present an award to Don Kendall. And I had the, uh, the opportunity to sit next to him at dinner this evening. And I can only tell you that what I'm about to share with you doesn't even come close to representing the remarkable career uh, that this man has had. Truly remarkable. I didn't need these last year, by the way. Donald Kendall is co-founder of PepsiCo and was chairman and chief executive officer for 21 years before his retirement in May of 1986. Mr. Kendall served as chairman of the board's executive committee from 1986 to 1991. Mr. Kendall, a National Business Hall of Fame laureate, has been recognized as one of the giants of American industry. Not only did he build one of the world's premier consumer product companies, he also used his position in business to serve his nation, to advance the cause of international understanding, and to promote human equality and justice. Mr. Kendall joined Pepsi Cola Company as a fountain syrup sales representative, following distinguished service in World War II as a naval aviator. He advanced from sales to managing a sales crew to managing sales for all company operating plants. 
1957, Mr. Kendall had become president of Pepsi-Cola's overseas operations, and under his leadership, the number of countries in which Pepsi-Cola was available more than doubled while sales tripled. In 1965, Mr. Kendall engineered the merger that brought Pepsi-Cola Company together with Frito-Lay to create PepsiCo. Mr. Kendall was appointed President and Chief Executive Officer of the new company. He was elected Chairman and Chief Executive Officer in 1971, a position he held until his retirement. Under Mr. Kendall's leadership, PepsiCo became one of the largest corporations in the United States. PepsiCo divisions also expanded their operations to new areas of the world, including the former USSR, where Pepsi-Cola was the first foreign consumer product to be sold, and to the People's Republic of China. Mr. Kendall has been widely recognized for his contributions to American business. In 1987, the board of editors of Fortune magazine selected Mr. Kendall for induction into the National Business Hall of Fame, where he joined such business legends as Andrew Carnegie, Thomas Edison, Alfred Sloan, and John D. Rockefeller. This award recognizes outstanding business leaders who have contributed significantly to the growth of the private enterprise system and of this country. A native of Seacombe, Washington, Mr. Kendall attended Western Kentucky State College. He is the recipient of an honorary doctorate of law from Stetson University, an honorary doctorate of law from Babson College, and a doctor of laws from Gonzaga University. Mr. Kendall also received Doctor of Humane Letter degrees from Mercy College, Manhattan College, the State University of New York, and Long Island University. Now, I must just add one thing before I bring Don up here. I, during dinner, I noticed that he ordered a Pepsi more than once. <laughs> and I couldn't help but ask him, what happens if you go to one of those rare places that doesn't offer Pepsi but offers Coke instead? And his answer was simple. I simply order water. <laughs> it is my sincere pleasure to present Donald N. Kendall with the Foreign Policy Association Medal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's, it's really a great pleasure and wonderful to be here. And of course, when you're 89 years old, it's nice to be anywhere. <laughs> I thought that uh, I was probably being re be recognized more for what I did an inter international rather than the, than the total, total bio. So I'll tell you some of the funny stories about you know, international. I was the first one to open up uh, Russia. I went there actually in 1959 with uh, Nixon when Nixon was vice president. And a lot of you told, probably don't remember that Eisenhower and Khrushchev at that time wanted to try and get the relationship started between the two countries. And, Russia had a big exhibit over here, and the U.S. had one in, in Russia. And uh, I decided to go over there. Uh, most American companies were refusing to go. But I decided to go because our friend Alana Coca-Cola had most of Western Europe. They went in World War II and uh, got a strong position in Europe. So I decided, why not get Eastern Europe? And, uh, and uh, <laughs> so, so I went over and uh, was being highly criticized by a lot of people, some of our own company for wasting money going to, to Russia. So the night before the opening, I told Nixon, I said, uh, fortunately I knew uh, Nixon, I said, I've got to get a Pepsi in Khrushchev's hand or I'm in trouble. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, so he brought him by when they were having the kitchen debate and uh, brought uh, Khrushchev up and uh, t <clears throat> told him he had a Pepsi Cola uh, made in and, and Russia, we'd made it there from, from concentrated syrup. And, and I said, I have one I brought from the United States. And I said, I want you to taste both of them to show you that we can make it just as well in Russia. And uh, Khrushchev tasted <coughs> both of them, then turned to the press and said, drink the Pepsi Cola made in Moscow. It's much better than the one made in the United States. <laughs> and, and then started handing out Pepsis to everybody who came around. You run around the stuff. And handed them out to everybody. 
And uh, you can imagine the publicity that we got uh, around the world with Khrushchev handing out Pepsi. So, uh, <coughs> unfortunately, after uh, that exhibit, as probably some of you remember, um, our plane got shot down and that stopped the relationship and didn't get going again until uh, 1970. And uh, uh, I went over and, and made the first deal with, uh, with the Russians and it was all barter uh, in those days. <coughs> Uh, you, you couldn't change money, uh, so we decided to bring Stolichnaya over here, the, the Russian vodka, <laughs> and uh, that's how we got our, our money out. We got into the into the vodka business, and, <laughs> and I'll tell you one of the stories. I opened up the rest of Europe, all, uh, Eastern Europe too. We opened up Poland, Czech, Hungary, Bulgaria, uh, Romania, and uh, the Polish ambassadors here. You know, Tell you the story on, on Poland. I went to negotiate with them, and, and uh, they said we want you to take the Polish vodka, and and I said, well, I've got the Russian vodka, and he says, well, the Polish vodka is much better than the Russian vodka, and, and uh, so we couldn't take took both of them, but we finally found a way to get our money out of Poland also, and but. <laughs> But for example, the success of Operation Russia, we have 17,000 employees in Russia today. So it's a very successful. Uh, 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 I was also the first one to open China uh, <coughs> when Deng Xiaoping took over China. Uh, he wanted to open it up. Unfortunately, I'd been there in the early days in the, in the 70s with uh, when George Bush was our representative and spent a week with George bicycling around Beijing, looking at retail stores and so forth to find out what was going on, and, and then uh, negotiated a deal with, uh, with uh, Deng Xiaoping and uh, uh, opened up in China. We've got big operations also there. And on India, uh, some of you know that in India, uh, uh, there are a lot of companies there and, and, 50s and 60s. In fact, I opened up India in the 50s, but then everybody, we all pulled out because it got impossible to do business. And uh, when young Gandhi took over, uh, he wanted to change uh, things and get uh, the U.S. back involved again. Came over as during the Reagan administration. So Gandhi went to our Secretary of Commerce, then was uh, Baldwin, and told him that he wanted to get American companies to come. So Baldwin told me, he said, well, get Don Kendall. He opened up the Soviet Union. He can do that for you. And uh, that night at the White House, Reagan grabbed me and he said, Don, he said, I want you to meet with young Gandhi in the morning. And he wants to talk to you about getting companies. So I went over and actually made a deal with uh, Gandhi and the fellow who's now the prime minister, who was in the <coughs> finance, and uh, made an agreement that everybody thought I was crazy. but. They said they would change it as they got control of things, and they did. And we have a very big operation in India. And I, I also set up, to, as I did in the Soviet Union, uh, ran the U.S.-China or U.S.-India Council, and set it up and took a whole bunch of business people over there, as I did in, in <coughs> Russia. In fact, when I set up, we were talking at the table, uh, the deal in in Russia, I brought American companies over, I had about 20 of them. A lot of them flew over for the meeting in private company planes. And uh, Russia had never handled uh, company planes before. And you had to stop in Europe and get a Russian pilot and to fly in with you. <coughs> and uh, so the morning when uh, the, the Minister of Trade uh, opened the meeting, he got up and apologized to him for the trouble that it might have caused them flying over the difficulties and so forth. And uh, uh, they weren't used to handle them on the ground and, uh, and apologized for the delay. But he said, isn't it amazing? The only man we're doing business with came in here in air flight. <laughs> so uh, those are the good old days and it's uh, great to be here and great to be part of this uh, group tonight. And I thank you very much for Thank you. Is that you with the Foreign Policy Association Medal? Thank you, Don. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, with the cooperation of five amazing people, I hope you enjoyed your dinner tonight. We're getting you out on time, which we promised. And I want to thank these, uh, these astounding speakers tonight and for the, uh, the generosity of all of our members. And we wish you a good night until we see you at the next annual meeting, annual dinner. Good night.